Hey, it's Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. And uh, today we've got the 2300 subscriber special. You're like, what? 2300? Why 2300? Well, it's kind of because the 2000 subscriber special kind of got away from me. I, I had grand plans for what I was going to do for that. It was going to be a huge continuation of my 1000 subscriber special. After all, there's a thousand new subscribers and many people are wondering like who this Joel Duff guy is. What a little bit more about what makes him tick. And if you want to know some of that, my sort of story of like how I came to be, all right, my history, you can find that in the 1000 subscriber special. But I wanted the 2000 subscriber special to be a little something else, you know, kind of like hitting some theological points or like some, some more deeply philosophical sort of uh, machinations about like my experience here on YouTube. But no, that just took too much thought. I have too many things going on. And I kept procrastinating. You know, I kept I kept thinking about what I was going to do. I wrote out a bunch of notes, and finally, I'm just like, nah, just going to throw a little quick something together. It's going to be kind of like a channel update. That's basically what this is. It is going to be more about like who I am and the way I think. I'm going to introduce you to my new website, joelduff.org, where you can learn more about me, and I'll show you that and explain why I I made that particular website. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, future projects, like what do I got coming up this year what's what's on the docket at least what are my aspirational goals for what i want to achieve uh, over the next uh, say nine months now okay so that's what we have coming up next okay let's start out with uh i'll kind of bundle these three things together who's joel Duff? like who am i who is this person that you you may have subscribed to and what can you expect to hear from in the future? Um, I want to talk a little bit about my target audience. And what about, am I a Christian apologist? Some people ask me, like, what's your, well, what's your type of Christian apologetics? Um, or why don't you sort of do Christian apologetics more on your station? I want to address that uh, very briefly. But let's just start with this question, who's Joel Duff? Let me give you another glimpse of maybe, like, who is this Joel Duff, right? Let's draw the curtain aside and ask, who is that man behind the curtain? Um, and maybe the best way of doing that is, again, like I said, to take you to my, my new website, joelduff.org. So let's go there. All right, so here we are. Now, I, I get a lot of questions. So in the chat, um, comments sections, I get a lot of questions about, like, Joel, what do you think of this? What do you believe about this? If you are a long-term subscriber, you know that mostly I talk about science more so, and maybe I'm talking about critiquing young earth creationism. Uh, and many people have questions about, like, yes, but what do you believe? Like, like, what is your particular position on X topic? Right? Usually a theological question. Uh, and so, yes, I will talk about those things and have talked about some of my particular positions and beliefs on matters, but I can't cover it all. And many times I can't cover it in real depth. And that has to do also with this idea that I'm not explicitly a Christian apologetic station. This isn't my main goal is to be a Christian apologist. I'm a Christian who thinks about and does science and thinks about how that science relates to him me, uh, but I'm not explicitly setting out to be like, my goal is to be defend all different positions of the Christian faith, right? I'm comfortable in my faith and I know things that I believe, um, but a Christian apologist is something a little bit different in the sense that that is their, their, their thing that they are trying to do is defend the Christian faith. I'm, I'm coming to you as somebody who doesn't feel like I have to defend myself I'm showing you, and remember, and my audience is, is highly varied in terms of their particular background, but I'm showing you a person who lives as a Christian uh, and hopefully acts like a Christian, uh, who is living a life of a, as a professional scientist. And how does that person think about the things that, um, that I learn and that I do and that I see every day uh, in that particular scientific realm? Uh, and that is my primary interest. And I'm, I'm also interested in just general science communication and, the, and, the, and the teaching because I am a teacher. You see up here at the top of my new website, I've got husband, father, Christian, scientist, educator, 
blogger and YouTuber. Right? That's sort of like, what are some basic words to describe like who I am and what I'm interested in doing? And those are the things that identify who I am, right? I'm a long time husband. I am a father. I have five kids. Uh, I am a Christian. I am a, I'm a Protestant Christian of the, as you're going to see in a few moments, of the Reformed tradition. Uh, and I am a scientist, specifically I'm a biologist or a, a molecular systematist, if you want to be really specific. Uh, I'm an educator. I have a job. This is not my job, what I'm doing right now. This is completely a side thing, just out of my own interest. I'm a professor of biology, and so I teach biology classes to a whole lot of students at a variety of different levels, from the uh, non-major students um, to majors, um, biology students, mostly biomedical uh, science students, uh, and then also at the graduate level, and I've had PhD students and graduated PhD students. So sort of all those different levels of mentoring and being an educator. I have a blog that I've uh, maintained for well over 10 years, uh, some 450 posts there. Uh, the Nat Naturalis Historia or the naturalhistorian.com is the, the address of that. Uh, and then more recently, the last two years, I'm calling myself a YouTuber. All right, that's my latest incarnation uh, is uh, as a YouTuber. Uh, and so back to like, why did I make this particular website? Well, I, I just get a lot of questions as I get more subscribers, right? From a thousand to two thousand subscribers, the number of questions that come to me are increasing and I can't write like individual personal responses to everybody. I need something to refer to. So this is going to be my go-to, like, you want to know probably what I think about a particular subject, especially on the theological side of things, right? Uh, on the side of my, my, my Christian side, as you might say. You want to know how I think and how I feel and what my influences are, like what, where do I come from? Then I'm going to lay out on this website sort of my, what has influenced me in the past and what my present sort of views are. Not explicitly like saying, you know, am I prelapsarian or, you know, what's my eschatology or, you know, we could go down a bunch of doctrinal issues. What do I, what are my specific views? But what I am saying is you can probably infer what my views most likely are from the literature that I'm going to uh, list on this particular site. All right. So anyway, here we go. We've got uh, Joel Duff writing, speaking, thinking about life. I'm a biologist. Time. I'm interested in the age of the earth uh, as it relates to the question of uh, the interpretation of Genesis. And so I I, I think a lot about what the evidence is for how old the earth is. So that's why the word time in there. Purpose. Of course, I'm interested in purpose. Why are we here? Uh, you know, what is, what is my purpose in life? And what am I to be doing to make this world a better place? What is my purpose, ultimate, my ultimate purpose, right? Uh, and then, of course, Christian faith, right? All those things are the things that sort of make me who I am. Uh, all right, then blah, blah, blah. I've got a bunch of, got some entry stuff here. Uh, so then I have listed here, and I'll go through here because this will give you a, a decent idea of like uh, some more things about me. All right, in terms of my own personal identity, well, I just talked about those. Christian, father, husband. Um, there's my kiddos right there. I have one. Um, my oldest daughter is married, so I have a son-in-law, uh, which is awesome. Um, and then we got research interest. So what is my research? I've really not talked a lot about my research. Uh, and I do plan on actually covering some of my publications and talking about the significance of those at some point. That's sort of like, I just don't think they're probably the most interesting thing. So I've been trying to, I've been saving a, a bunch of sort of like quick little things I can do later. Uh, and one of those is some of my research material. But I would characterize my overall like research interest as genetic variation across taxonomic levels, especially using molecular techniques, right? Looking at DNA sequences or enzyme analysis, some kind of way at the molecular level of looking at variation, either between, well, it could be within individuals, um, multicellular individuals, but usually it's between individuals and populations. 
could be between populations, could be between different species, could be between different genera. I've worked at all those different what we call taxonomic levels, and I've answered and researched questions at all those particular levels. Sometimes those have been my projects. Sometimes I have been conscripted into other colleagues' projects and added this sort of molecular genetic component to them. Um, there you can see my, my academic credentials. I have a bachelor's in science from Calvin College. That's a private college in Michigan. Um, and you can see from its name, its namesake is come, does come from John Calvin. So it is a, um, it is in the heritage of reformed theology, that particular school. From there, I went to the University of Tennessee, uh, Department of Botany, and I got a master's degree in botany. I stayed at the same institution, but I switched advisors. Um, to work on a different project. Uh, and there, uh, you know, so my first project was on a type of fern, and I did a molecular systematic analysis and looked at whether two different populations of ferns were really two different species, which I determined that they were, and therefore established that uh, different name for another species. Then I went on, I stayed at the University of Tennessee, different faculty member, and worked on a different organism, well, actually the same organism, but sort of broader questions, looking at systematics of a fern group called Isoetes. Uh, and I collected lots and lots of different species, did DNA sequence analysis, and what's called RIFLIPS, restriction fragment length polymorphisms, which is, that shows how old I am. If you know your molecular systematics, uh, nobody would do that today. That's an older technology. So I would characterize my PhD as being in botany in general, as a, as a general subdiscipline, but specifically in plant molecular systemic, systematics. Uh, and if you want to see my full professional curriculum vita, you can click on that link um, to see all of my publications. I'm up to, I have like 52 peer review publications. Um, I've had multiple NSF uh, grants, and so I've had and I've had a number of graduate students uh, who have done projects in my lab and so forth. More recently, last couple of years, I don't I'm not as involved in research as I once was. I right, so then I've got I'm a teacher. I mentioned that before. I'm a professor of biology at the University of Akron. I'm also a speaker for a nonprofit organization called Solid Rock Lectures, which is interested in communicating with with Christians about science and faith sort of topics. I'm also, I would consider myself an independent speaker on science and faith topics. I've done a whole lot of writing, right? I've written for my blog, which is the thing that comes up here next, thenaturalhistorian.com. Um, but I've also contributed to a book, uh, Grand Canyon Monument to an Ancient Earth. Uh, I have a couple peer-reviewed publications that relate to sort of science faith uh, topics. One's called Flood Geology's Abominable Mystery, which is about uh, the pollen record uh, in the in the geological column, uh, and relating that to flood geology or why it's a, an abominable problem for uh, creationists, uh, and I've also written another article about the question of what uh, speciation is for young Earth creationism, and that's the article of descent with modification. Then I've got my blog, over 450 posts. Most of those are are related to science faith sort of topics. Uh, and I have some links to some basic categories. You can see like some types of articles that I've written, certainly not all of them linked there, although you can find them all there. But uh, And then more recently, what you're watching right now, which is my YouTube channel, right, which I've already done some 300 videos uh, for. And there's my link to the 1,000 subscriber special, which I put there because I kind of give my sort of story uh, in that particular video. Um, all right, so ongoing projects. I was thinking about like, you know, what are the main initiatives that I'm working on right now? Well, one big one is sort of like trying to sum up my views on Genesis and maybe origins questions overall, answering like the big questions. Something I've been working on for quite a while. Uh, I had 11 part series that was on my blog that I've kind of deconstructed and I'm trying to rework and I'm calling it kind of like distilling John Salehammer, John John Salehammer is an Old Testament theologian that I particularly appreciate, uh, especially his interpretations of Genesis. Uh, I don't agree with him completely, and one of the things I'm trying to do is figure out how to build a number of different ideas I've gotten from a number of people with sort of Salehammer's work, uh, which is kind of helping to create my own, uh, not my own view, but my own understanding 
you know, uh, because there's never been a single thing that I've ever read from anyone else who are like, yeah, they're right on. They get this 100% right. I, I completely agree with that. I can find fault with, with any paradigm, uh, any interpretive framework uh, for Genesis. Uh, there's just so many questions there. Uh, big series that I'm working on, which you'll see a little bit in a few minutes, uh, Middle East Geology and Biblical Timeline. I want to talk about actual places in the Levant, right? The biblical uh, world. And look at, look at them from a geological perspective and relate that to flood geology and young earth creationism and show that the Bible actually provides us with like some distinct like markers of like what these lands look like in the past, right? Because we have actual evidence and descriptions from scriptures from thousands of years ago. And we're going to relate that to the way they look now and their geological history. Um, I've been holding off, honestly, I've been holding off on the series because I think it's going to be really good. Um, I'm really proud of that series I've written on my blog, and I'm going to redo that whole series for my blog in video format. Uh, and I've been holding off on it because when I didn't have that many subscribers, I don't want to say I didn't, well, it's going to sound bad. I mean, I don't want to waste it on a few people, all right? I wanted to kind of wait to showcase this when I had a little bit larger following. And I think that, you know, with 2,000 subscribers, um, there's plenty there. Uh, I'm also working on a project. I've got right in front of me, I've got stacks of books um, on late 19th century, early 20th century history as it relates to uh, the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, so lots of books on the Scopes Monkey Trial itself, but I'm also doing lots of stuff with Princeton Theology uh, Theological Seminary. Uh, and the history of the development of uh, where did theistic evolution, some ideas about evolutionary theory and how, how they are understood in that particular time frame. Uh, and so that's a, that's a really like big project um, that I'm working on right now. And uh, another big series, which is also a blog series, I'm going to turn into a video series, is Consider the Ostrich. And so that's, again, going to be examining biological origins from the perspective of what do we learn in, well, the book of Job in scriptures about the ostrich and relating that to questions about speciation, about origins, about the nature of, of uh, the, uh, the nature of nature, you know, how good are ostriches today uh, versus their original creation within the young earth creationist perspective. Uh, and that relates to that last big topic, which is something I've always uh, thought about, which is what are the effects of the fall of man? What are the effects of sin on physical creation? Because that, of course, is a huge deal for young earth creationists. This is, this is a foundational topic for them. Um, yeah, I've won a bunch of awards, teaching and research. Uh, we'll pass over those. I'm going to gloat over my many achievements, that many, but I am actually quite proud of, of several of these uh, awards. Uh, I do, I used to, I don't do so much anymore, a lot of photography, especially landscape photography. I've taken my photography very seriously, and I share all that on my photography website, uh, Beach Nut Photography. All free to use, free to download. Um, and so that's it. That's my main thing. Now, I've got this thing down here at the bottom where I talk about what shapes my beliefs, right? We all have influences. We all have things that have influenced us growing up. And maybe we've gone through transitions in our life where, we've, we were, where we were influenced by different things at different times. And I've, I've had that. Right? It's not like I've been one uniform uh, viewpoint my entire life. I've had people come in and out and persuade me of different ideas. And I've I've been, I've, you know, tried out ideas, uh, you know, in terms of let myself be swayed by certain positions and, uh, um, and then either accepted them or throw them away. Like, yes, I tried that out. I vetted that idea. And I think I'm going to go back to what I, what I originally thought on that particular topic. And so I've got a, a web page, ideological blueprint, blueprints, right? What is the blueprint of what makes Joel Duff? Uh, who he is. And then I also have a page that's like my core beliefs, like really write down. And then, whenever I'm talking about my core beliefs, that's really my, you know, theologically, what do I believe about the world and why, how the world exists as it does and what the meaning of that world is. And you can see that I've got a bunch of links to various uh, reformed theological uh, documents there. Uh, so let's go up here and I'll just show you uh, really quick. Um, things you might be interested 
or I might send you to if you ask me a question. What do I believe? Right? And here I'm focused on this intersection of science and faith, right? Like what I, I made position statements for myself here of how do I integrate faith and science? That's a question that many people will get. And, and like, how is it that you are inter, how do you see both of those things intertwining, whether they don't? What's the Venn diagram look like for those? Uh, what's my view on sovereignty, divine sovereignty and the order of things in the world? What's my view on the doctrine of creation? Who the creator is and what he's created and how he's created what's our mandate here on earth what about providence and secondary causes right there's fiat creation and then there is god's maintaining of the of the world um so and i've got just other basic statements about what i think about reason and faith the fall the impact on humanity of the fall um, that goes back to something I said I'll, I'll talk a lot more, a lot about on this particular channel in the future. Big ultimate purpose and meaning statement. All right, so some big stuff here, like the big, big, big picture. Uh, then I've got ideological blueprints. And this is like, you know, who's influenced me? Well, like my parents, <laughs> they've had a, a tremendous influence on, on who I am today. Uh, and if you don't know, my father is a, a minister, all right? And he's a minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, which is a, a Reformed uh, theological uh, denomination, denomination of the Reformed faith. Uh, and so here are things that I would describe as like reflecting many of my particular views on theology, all right? And how... I think biblical interpretation should uh, go about. What are my biblical hermeneutic um, methods? Uh, and so I've got a, a bunch of, like I would consider really influential books. Now, I just want to point out here, because a lot of people who don't know Reformed theology might like just associate Reformed theology, they just think Calvinism. Uh, and that's either triggers you like severely, um, or you're like, I know exactly what he's talking about. Or you might think, I know what he's talking about, but you might not actually know what I'm talking about because there's many different strains of Reformed theology, right? And it kind of tends to get lumped together into one thing, especially for those who don't know Reformed theology or the Reformed faith or Reformed tradition. Uh, and there are certain spokespeople for Reformed theology, some of which I don't really care for very much. <laughs> and so, and I would not characterize myself as followers of them. Um, and so there's a bunch of different strands of Reformed theology, you know, some of which go down a post-millennial eschatological um, strain, which I have dabbled in in the past, but I am not. Um, there's Christian Reconstructionists that are, that are um, Reformed, have Reformed theology roots, and I'm not a Christian Reconstructionist, or a, which often is also melded into Christian nationalism. Um, and so there's... And then that's not all, right? There's a there's a whole bunch of different sort of, I guess you could slivers or strands of the Reformed tradition or Reformed faith. Uh, and so the discerning eye will see that there is a particular theme here in my particular books that I've picked out and people that are influential in my life because uh, they come from a particular strain of Reformed theology that is probably not the strain that if you don't know Reformed theology, you probably have in your mind. Yeah, the, the assumptions you probably have might not really be accurately represent uh, my particular viewpoints. Um, and so I guess the best description of me is I'm, I follow something called biblical theology, uh, which is a particular hermeneutical method, a particular way of interpreting scripture. Um, as opposed to, say, me or like systematic theology, which isn't exclusive to Reformed theology, but Biblical theology is, and that's why uh, most of the people here are in that particular um, historical lineage of Reformed theology. Is all right. Then below that, then I've got how about science and faith? Like, how do I relate science and faith? What about theologians who have thought about this topic, and how do I relate to them? Like, what what ones do I agree with? So these are all people that have had a lot of influence on me. Again, I don't, I'm not espousing every word that has come out of their mouth. Like I said, I could find disagreements in every single one of these books. 
but on the whole, I will find a large amount of agreement. And so that gives you some idea of like where I'm at. Um, and so I highlight a bunch of my most favorite books. And I've got a bunch of articles uh, listed here too. Most of these should go to sites where they're free to download um, and not behind paywalls. Uh, in any case, they're my downloads and they're actually on this particular website here. Uh, and so a bunch of articles that represent what I think are really key, important uh, topics, statements, um, ways of looking at um, hard, really hard topics sometimes. Uh, and then I threw in like, hey, there's a bunch of other, it's, it's not just all about science and faith, right? I mean, there's lots of other topics in this world. There's lots of other issues. And people want to know sometimes what I think about those issues because they want to try to figure out, you know, who I am for either for nefarious purposes or because they're really interested. Um, and so I just give you a smattering of some other topics and sort of like books that I would find influential. Uh, and I even share some of my eschatological views here. Uh, who are the most influential pastors and ministers? There's my father right there on top. Uh, and then some specifics to the age of the earth and evolutionary biology. And then I've got a couple other, like what I think are important resources um, that hit again, much broader topics. All right, so that is a, this will be a growing list. This is just like my first stab at like, out of all the materials that I have and like all the books that I have and that I've read, which ones have been the most influential? Um, now, I mean, are most influential and most like my viewpoints now. So there, there are some really like significant books out there that, um, and, and authors that I've read or that I follow that I disagree with quite a bit, but that doesn't, that means they, they, they still have a lot of influence on me in the sense that they've made me think, right? In some cases, I've, I've thought that they were right about some things for quite a while until I really spent a lot of time and finally convinced myself that that's, that's not the best view. Uh, and so, you know, reading, a, I read a wide, you know, breadth of different viewpoints, especially on science and faith, but even on other topics. I'm willing to pick up and read a variety of different viewpoints in order to solidify what my own viewpoint is or to always be asking myself, questioning myself, do I really, am I really on the right track here? All right? In reform theology, you're saying like always reforming, right? Always, you know, always questioning and always looking and seeking to have a better answer than what you might have had before. This is basically my science and faith CV right here. Oh, there's a more extensive one linked um, here, but these are like other papers, all the talks that I've given. Uh, and so you can see the different types of things that I've done. And I'll, I'll add a growing list here to like links to interviews that I've done and so forth. So this will be like a, a place to collect all that. So a lot of that's maybe on YouTube, some things on a blog, some things elsewhere. This will be kind of like a clearinghouse for like all the different things that, uh, that I've done. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Oh, well, coming soon. I don't know how soon, um, but my, my aspiration here would be within the next couple of months is to have a page that answers a whole bunch of other like common questions that I get. Things that I get asked and then I feel like, yeah, I really need to, you know, this person really is interested. They really, you know, it's an honest question. I get lots of questions I don't think are terribly honest. They're kind of like gotcha questions. They just, they're not interested in hearing because I'm only interested in having dialogue with somebody who's willing to dialogue. Like if I'm, 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 if you're going to listen to me, I need to listen to you. All right. And that's a lot of what I'm about is trying to create better dialogue. And I, I admit I'm not always successful. Right. I, I'm, I'm a sinner. <laughs> like my human nature takes over. Um, I don't act appropriately at times, but I'm constantly reminding myself that I'm trying to generate better conversation. Um, and I'm trying to, that means being a good listener. That means trying to understand other people's viewpoints, trying to represent them correctly. Uh, and so what I want to do here is, you know, some of the hard questions, origin of life, are there miracles still going on? Why do I always talk about Ken Ham? I have an answer to that. Um, 
how does nature affected by sin? That's a really important thing to have an answer to because it tells you a lot about how somebody views the world. And so if you knew my answer to that, it would explain a lot of my other positions on things. Uh, global flood, that's always a big question from, from a lot of people. What about Adam and Eve? All right, see, these are, these are the big questions that I dabble around, but I don't necessarily always like come straight out uh, and, and talk about uh, all the time. And, or I have talked about, or I maybe have at one point, like somewhere in a video, but of course, you know, none of you have watched all my videos. If you have, I mean, that's incredible. I, that would blow my mind um, that anyone would want to spend that much time listening to my videos. But uh, even if you've listened only to a, a 50th of them, okay, you will not have stumbled across some of the answers to these questions. And so then therefore you'll be tempted to ask the question, and so this will be my way of saying, like, here's my answer. And I'll probably put some links to videos where you could find me talking about it as well. All right, so that's the idea that this would be kind of a growing list of, like, here's my current thinking, my current answers to these questions. Um, yeah, who is my audience? Well, I know kind of who they are by breakdown of who comes and who I see in the chat and who's, who's uh, putting comments. Uh, and who's linking and who's liking on Facebook, right? But that's not what I mean by who my audience is. It's like, who's my target audience? Like, who am I trying to communicate to? When I, when I sit around and think about, like, what video I'm going to make out of my 100 choices, like, I, I have a list of 100 different topics that are like, yeah, I'd like to make a video about it. I want to make a video about this. And guess what? That every week, I think of something different or something that's brand new or hot or somebody says something or Ken Ham, that gets me thinking about that. And I end up making a video about that, which just backlogs the hundred, you know, other ones that are like, these are like really essential things I want to get to. Uh, but so what do I think about when I'm thinking about that list? All right. I am communicating mostly with seekers, all right? People who, people may have doubts, people have questions people who have heard different sides of stories um, and who are open to exploring hard questions and hard topics on the, in the intersection of science and faith. Many of you are interested in, like, I'm, I also love telling science stories and explaining, you know, stuff that I have expertise in and trying to communicate that to an audience that may not have that kind of level of experience. And so I'm bringing sort of like, hopefully some sophisticated uh, scientific research to, to you. And that might not have an overlay of like, oh yeah, science and faith or my Christianity or other things that who I identify as just like, I'm a scientist and I'm communicating to you. So some of those are that way, but you'll also realize that I'm, that's not the major thing that's making me tick. I am, the reason I stay up late at night and I spend my extra spare time doing this um, is not to like entertain um, people who just want to, you know, make fun of young earth creationists. There's plenty to make fun of of young earth creationists in terms of their understanding of science at times. Um, and you're us, I, but I'm not, you know, there's other people who do that well and have a good time with it. And it's maybe a form of entertainment. I'm not, that, that's not what I'm uh, looking for. I'm looking for people who actually have real questions. Like most people who are looking for that foreign entertainment, they already know how they feel. And they're just, you know, interested in learning more about science at the same time. They're kind of using creation science to raise questions that they can learn, that they can then learn more about science in general at the same time, kind of like, hey, what's this creation science thing doing and why are they doing it this way? Uh, I'm interested in people who have probably grown up under that paradigm of being a young earth creationist. And there's just little doubts in their minds or if other things that they've heard or they know that the consensus view is, is, doesn't support their particular view and they wonder why. Uh, and they need somebody who has read thoroughly that particular literature, um, but also lives in the world of science, but, but also is a Christian who is a relatively, I'll say quite orthodox Christian in terms of the historical creeds and, uh, and perspectives of especially the, the Protestant faith. Uh, and so 
I have taken the question of the interpretation of Genesis very, very seriously. Uh, and so, and I don't I want to make fun of the individuals who, you know, have different viewpoints or have struggled with this particular topic. Uh, and so my aim isn't always necessarily to convince, but it's simply to provide perspective, provide somebody to have feedback uh, with and from. And so that would be my primary audience. And that's kind of a thin slice of the overall pie, right? Because if I look at like who the overall like 2000 subscribers are, there's some that are, um, there's not many that are like, hey, young earth creationists that are following me for that purpose. But it is people who are stumbling on site because they have these types of questions. And there's a whole bunch of people who are like completely convinced that young earth creationists is, is nonsense. I mean, and, and probably a third of my audience thinks that Christianity is nonsense. Um, and so, as I said before, I'm not a Christian apologist necessarily. I mean, every Christian is an apologist of some sort because their life should reflect their beliefs and they should also wish that others would understand and conform to those beliefs as well because they think that that is uh, what's best for them, right, uh, eternally. Uh, and so, yes, there is that general care and interest and anyone who writes me and, you know, I'm going to I'll answer those questions. But I'm not like out like thumping on that particular topic like that is the thing that I'm doing uh, is preaching, you know, uh, Christian apologetics or preaching the gospel on this site. Um, and so, you know, so I have an audience that's of a whole bunch of different persuasions and I've got a whole bunch of different videos that kind of touch different things that different audiences are interested in. Uh, but what I think is kind of unique and interesting is that because I have a different varied audiences, I'm actually bringing people together that have very different views. <laughs> you know, I mean, they probably are like really antithetical views with respect to like politics and different social issues and all that. Um, and so they're really different and they're in the same chat together, right? And, and, but they're kind of unifying behind, you know, a fascination with science, a fascination with the topic of creationism, uh, and just big questions about life. Uh, and if done properly, you can have a conversation about those where you completely disagree with me and you disagree with somebody else, but we're learning how to understand each other's beliefs. Um, and you know, my hope is deep down is that yes, you'll, you'll find my beliefs intriguing and want to know more. But like I said before, it's not a, it's not an explicit like intention of this particular site to be like a Christian apologetic site. That's not my first and foremost uh, thing that I'm interested in. Um, all right. I think I've said that too many times actually, because kind of makes me sound like I don't want to defend the faith, but that's not really true. The thing is, I'm fairly set and comfortable with my views, and I don't necessarily feel like I have to defend them all. I only have to defend them in the sense of, of um, you know, how they interact and how they interrelate to other topics that other people are interested in, especially the science uh, topic. But I don't feel like I have to have a defense for every single particular view that I have. I mean, the reality is that you grow up and I'm, you know, I studied some particular doctrinal issues probably 30 years ago now. And so I worked through certain doctrines and came to the conclusion of X, Y, or Z that that is like what my, you know, I came, came comfortable that that's what I believe is, is to be true about that particular doctrine, right? You're taught something when you're really little, but then you realize like, okay, well, that's just what I was told, but it's not really what you believe. Then you go through a phase of working through and asking yourself, do I really believe that? Why do I believe it? Uh, and then you might explore different concepts. You might, you might suddenly find out there's other people who believe other things. And why do they believe those things? And eventually you come, to, you kind of, you coalesce on one thing that, really seems to fit and make a cohesive worldview that, that within your worldview, right? I mean, for me, some of those things are like 30 years ago, 
And so if you ask me like, okay, I want you, I want you to make a defense of this particular doctrinal viewpoint. Um, I was like, I know what my view is, but I haven't studied that topic. It hasn't been really like a central burning question for me for a long time. It's so therefore, I'm not going to present like a stout defense, right? Okay, let's go to these Bible verses and here's the logic and here's these other viewpoints and you're, you're not going to get that from me, right? That's where a Christian apologist, if that's like their, that's what their aim is, right? They study up on all these different types of topics and they have conversations across a wide variety of theological issues. So it doesn't mean I don't have a viewpoint. It's just that I'm not necessarily ready to defend every single of those viewpoints because I'm settled on those and I'm not, I don't find it necessary for me to have like all that knowledge at the, at the tip of my brain at all times. Okay, uh, that's enough on that about me being, uh, being either either being or not being a Christian apologist. Okay, so I, I kind of talked about, you know, who my target audience is. It's a fairly narrow group of individuals who are, maybe they have doubts, right? Uh, they might have doubts that are like their young earth creationists and they have doubts. They might be atheists and they have doubts and questions um, about Christianity. Uh, and then you just have your like, hey, this is the way I grew up. I don't really know exactly what I believe. I hear all these different things. Um, and um, I wonder how you might sync those together. And I'm going to provide a possible avenue for understanding uh, those topics and creating a, I, will, I would hope, a consistent worldview uh, from that. All right, so that's my target audience, which is never going to be hundreds of thousands of people probably, but I'm comfortable with that. I'm not aiming for, you know, massive subscriber numbers. I'm just shocked that there's 2,000 subscribers, well, 2,300 subscribers now. Uh, and I'm, you know, that's, it does give me some motivation and, and helps me to feel like this is worth doing uh, and I actually enjoy it though because I love learning right I, I just I, I I'm always intrigued by some new question something said and that's why I love talking about creation science I mean creation scientists are very stimulating to me because you know they'll say things that just you you, you always ask yourself like could that really be true you know because you, you don't want to just like I don't want to just dismiss everything straight up some of some of are smart people right they really are and uh, they're trying to make sense of things. I find that the way that they view things makes me think like, why is that wrong? You know, it's a really valuable exercise to ask why something else is wrong um, because it's exploring why something might be wrong or trying to explain why something is wrong helps you explain how you think, what you, what you, what you should think that is, right? It, it helps you understand your own viewpoint. This is the same thing that happens in Christian apologetics too. You can just, if you grew up just being told something and you're never really challenged by it, never really challenged, no one ever questioned you or had a different viewpoint that made you start to ask, oh, how do I know what I know? Then you never really explored the topic. And then you just, you just have a rote belief in that, right? But you don't have real knowledge. You don't have real, you haven't really made it your own belief. Uh, and there's so many people out there who have not really thought through most things in their lives, right? Uh, and so this, this station is to kind of challenge people to, to think. And if you decide that I'm wrong, I'm, I'm okay with that. But I would rather you at least think about it. I think you at least hear other positions out so that you strengthen your own faith, your own position. So you, you make your positions yours, not simply what you've been told to believe. All right, we're rambling. Let's, uh, let's keep on going. Otherwise, this 2300, special, uh, 2300 uh, subscriber special will be longer than the 1000 subscriber special. All right, so all I have left is I just want to give you a preview of coming attractions. Now, these are aspirational goals, meaning that these are high up on my list, but I get distracted. Uh, and then some of these are, might take a lot of time. And so I, I will get distracted by doing something that's easier to do. And it's just human nature. Uh, but I do have a working list of things. Like I have PowerPoints and I have notes and I'm, uh, you know, I pick up stuff and I'm like, okay, I'll keep working on that. Uh, and then I've got to get inspired to actually record it. Sometimes it's the recording. It's the hardest part. Um, I, everything's in my head. I love thinking about it. 
know what I want to say, maybe I've written it down, but just finding the time and a time when there's like no dogs or kids around too is hard to do. Um, so it's, it's the recording of the stuff that is probably the biggest uh, bottleneck in the whole process. Uh, I already mentioned the ostrich series. Okay, I've not made much progress on that yet, but I definitely want to do that soon. Uh, I will keep doing some more flood geology failures um, series because those are just ways for me to talk about fun like geology, biology, and astronomy, sort of interesting factoids, uh, and relate them to young earth creationism. Mostly geology for flood geology failures, obviously. Uh, what about this? You know, I, I've also been thinking about like all the different types of things I've talked about on my blog for 15 years and other things that I have on a list that I never wrote about. Uh, I want to come up with like a video that's like five evidences for an ancient earth that you've never heard before, right? There's so many lists of like, here's the best evidence for X, Y, and Z. Uh, and a lot of them are repeats uh, or just saying the same thing, you know, make, making the same arguments, uh, responding to the same things. I want to come up with like, I'll bet you never thought about this piece of data, like this particular thing. And there's lots of examples out there that are really cool and interesting. And so like five evidences for an ancient universe, five evidences for an ancient earth that are things maybe you've never thought of before. And what I like about doing like unique, um, unusual sources of data is that there isn't necessarily a quick response from young earth creationists on these. You see, they've all thought about Hey, the Grand Canyon, right? Starlight, uh, layers of rock that have certain types of compositions. Like, how would you explain that? Or the order of the fossil record? Or, you know, we could go on and on. Of like, here's some obvious, what seems to be obvious evidence that would be most easily interpreted as an ancient Earth. And of course, younger trials, younger creationists have been challenged with that. I'm trying to say young age creationists more than just young Earth, because we're really talking about the whole universe. Young age creationists, you know, it's not like they haven't thought about, they, they haven't been asked those questions, right? So they have answers to those. Um, so I, I like to come up with like just something completely out of left field because that makes everyone think. It even makes the young earth creationists think, oh, you know, I, I never thought about that particular form of evidence. And they're going to have to explore that. They're going to have to think about that. Uh, and react to it. And that that also opens up opportunities for conversation with not necessarily like Ken Ham or those type. They're never going to have conversations on these types of things uh, with those who aren't like them. But those who are in the young earth creationist world that are on the, on the fringes of that world that are truly interested in engaging and open to discussion. Uh, the lost world of, of the Nile River and the Dead Sea, right? Those are two places that are that play a large part in the biblical narrative. So we have historical records from the Bible describing the Nile area and the Dead Sea, especially the Dead Sea. We have very early, I mean Abraham, you know, sees the Dead Sea. And there's descriptions. You know, not not terribly not as descriptive as I would like, but still there are descriptions that allow us to tell us something about what the Dead Sea was like. Um, and so, and so we can infer what the, what the habitat of that area was. Ah, so I want to look at the geology, the origin of those particular geological features on the earth and relate that to the question of flood geology, young earth creationism. I think it's a really powerful challenge to young earth creationism to use the actual geological plate. See, the thing is, you know, you got the Grand Canyon, but the Grand Canyon is not anywhere near the Bible. The Bible never talks about the Grand Canyon. Right, so you don't have any like all young earth creation that say, well, it was formed after the flood, sometime. But you can't say that about uh, you know like the canyon that's underneath the Nile River, right? That was formed after the flood. Well, no, not really. It got it didn't get formed after the flood and get filled with sediments after the flood because you know there are Egyptians living there really soon afterwards on the Nile Delta. So the Delta has to exist like right after the flood, but the Dead Sea. You know, it used to be full of water. There's a lot of evidence. The whole thing was completely full of water. But even when Abraham looked at it, it wasn't full of water. All right, so we have some chronological timestamps in order to ask questions about the age of the Dead Sea and the age of the Nile River, which, are, which, are, which I think you'll find really fascinating if you've never thought about those locations before. And here's the thing. Young Earth creationists do not talk about these places. They just do not deal with 
geological formations in the bio, in the biblical land. Uh, and I think I know why. <laughs> and I'll explain that. Uh, the great flood boundary debate. I want to talk about where the flood boundary is and talk about the divisions within the Younger Creationist over that. Penguin huddling, one of my one of my favorite little videos. Uh, I will continue on this week in creationism. Ah, I want to address this question. This is a question I get. What about the Discovery Institute or Evolution News? Evolution News, I think it's .org. Um, what about intelligent designist? Why don't I spend a lot of time listening to them? Why don't I talk about their articles? Right, I'm always responding to Young Earth Creationist articles. I respond to Ken Ham. Obviously, I go to all the different Young Earth Creationist sites every single week, and I keep up on what's going on there because I'm doing this week in creationism series. And this every two weeks in creationism sometimes. Um, it's really hard to keep up on in terms of making videos. I keep up on all. It's just hard to make the videos every week. Um, but what about intelligent design? I barely pay attention to that. The whole realm of intelligent design, to me, uninteresting. And I, I'll make some kind of video in which I just talk about that. Like, why, why don't I care very much for intelligent design? And part of it has to do with the fact I don't think it's really an important, all that important of a movement. Um, and I honestly don't find it any more interesting. I find it less interesting than Young Earth Creationism. I don't find it any more challenging to me. I've learned so much more about science and been, been forced to think through so many more questions through my interactions with creation scientists than I have intelligent designists who I've learned virtually nothing from. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try to explore that idea a little bit further. Uh, ant mimic beetles. Got, got to get into some mimicry and talk about the origins of mimicry and relate that to like how that's a problem for creationism. Uh, talk a little bit about altruism with the exploding ants. It's another one of my favorite uh, blog posts. Um, I want to talk about where the next generation of young earth creationists is coming from. You know, is there a next, a next generation? Yes, I think there is. But what, what is the nature of that new generation? And this is another way for me to talk about what I call the new creationist, which is, I think, a, a somewhat growing and advancing group of creationists who are different than the, well, I'll call it the older generation. Yeah, inner circle young earth creationists from the last 15, 20 years. Ken Ham and ICR and Creation Ministries International, right? They're the old guard, I'll call them. Um, that is... Well, wouldn't discuss whether that's a dying breed or not. And then uh, I'm going to follow up on the Ark in the Darkness. I'm going to talk about some of the scientific problems uh, with that as well. All right, I think that's all the topics I've got. All righty, there it is. That's what I've got. That's what I've been up to. Um, I don't know what the new year will bring or the rest of this year, I was going to make this video in January because that's right about the time that I hit the 2,000 subscriber mark. But I'm at 2,300, um, on track to get to about 3,000 by the end of the year if I continue to make videos. It's obvious you have to continue to make videos in order to attract more um, attention. Uh, and I'll do that. Not, not really because I want to attract more uh, subscribers. Super happy to have more, but... Uh, Mostly because, you know, I do get a lot of really positive feedback. And that's really helpful. Like people are like, you know, hadn't thought about this before. That was really helpful. I appreciate um, the things that you're saying or doing. And those who say like they disagree, but they, they're challenged by what I say. Um, all those things uh, are, are really, really important to me. And I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate everybody out there who has subscribed, has watched even just five minutes uh, I'm still marvel that anyone would be willing to do that. Uh, and hopefully I'm building my craft a little bit better uh, as a public speaker. Um, YouTube is very different, and I've changed a lot from the very beginning of when I was doing YouTube to my style now, but I think my style is still evolving. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see where that goes in the future. Um, my setup is getting better in the sense that I'm improving the technology, um, but there's a lot of improvements I can still make. I do intend to try to do some live uh, things. Uh, that's going to take a little more software, but I can do some basic live stuff, which won't be having interviews or having other people on, but I will interact 
live with the with the chat, uh, and we can have some discussions about things that way. So I'm going to give that a try in the near future, uh, and I'm going to be doing some more interviews on other stations. So I'm getting more comfortable with the live interview stage. I am not a um, a terribly spontaneous person, um, and it's like the live thing is not like I'm not. I'll just say I'm not necessarily gifted for that particular uh, venue. Um, I need to record things and then cut out stuff where I'm like, oh, that was very poorly said and I say it again. So in this very video, I will be cutting some stuff out. <laughs> I have repeated myself a couple times in the last half hour uh, and I hopefully will remember to cut some of those repeats out um, as I stumbled over words or said something that I suddenly realized probably wasn't completely appropriate or well said. Um, and so this format, I'm, I'm becoming more comfortable with, with being uh, a little more spontaneous and just like letting myself go. Um, but it's, you know, I'm not a fast speaker. And so that's why watching me live is probably really annoying uh, or premieres because I'm talking pretty slowly. You should watch me on 2x speed, which is probably normal speed for some YouTube YouTubers out there. Um, Okay, yeah, I really am babbling along now. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is thanks for everybody's interest out there. I'll keep generating videos. Um, give me suggestions, uh, some feedback. I get so much feedback now, it's hard for me to keep up on all of it, but I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, and I just, I've been having a fun. I've really been having a lot of fun this past year uh, doing these videos for the station. So with all that, I'll say I'll bid adieu to you for now, and hopefully I'll see you in the future. As we discussed, who knows which one of these will be the next one up. But until then, see you later. Bye-bye.